Chris, introduce yourself and tell us what you're about. Okay, I won't, I won't be that lengthy this time. <laughs> so um, we've been got working all the time my... you need. Okay. Um, Dimitri has been, uh, you know, the long pole in this effort. Um, I started in System Verilog and, um, and he did the majority of the work. He's, he's an amazing System Verilog uh, guy. Um, he can't make it today, so I'm going to have to cover for his... Um, uh, somebody sharing the screen there. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, anyway, um, so uh, so anyway, I'm going to show you a quick video. He's got the the compiler working, and um, we have the source code for it. And I'm going to show a short video a little bit later. I'm going to talk to you guys about. A development board I've been working on. I'm about 80% complete. I'm going to share that. Um, in my uh, my ventures on LinkedIn, um, I ran across uh, Brett Gordon, who has an interest in quantum computing, and he told me an interesting story that he was trying to build um, a quantum computer um, emulator, and he tried a lot of different program C++ and um, and Python and other things and just couldn't get what he wanted. We talked a little bit about the core one and how he could do it in system Verilog and actually build a parallel type machine. And he was very interested in that. So that's just, it's something we're just exploring right now. I'm going to go ahead and let, um, um, let Brett take over and then I will finish up with I'll give you a, a video of the, the compiler uh, working, and also I'll talk to you about the new, uh, we call it an, uh, uh, the, the core one, the new board. So, Brett, you want to take it away? Uh, yeah, sure. All right. Um, so, I'm just going to generally start out. How many of you are familiar with quantum computing and quibits? Um, raise your hands. I think would probably be the best one. I'm out of this. Um, general idea behind this is to use linear equations. Um, let me share my screen if I can. Let me get back to it. Let me share my screen. Let's see. Um, let's see. I'm going to type screen. All right. There we go. All right. Let's see, let's see if it'll work. Uh, let's see participants. Now I can see everything. So I'm going to start with this very simple. This is just a general um, side note to getting this started. Um, like I said, how many of you are familiar with quantum computing? Um, anyone familiar with it? Yes, I am. Let's see. Excuse um, my voice. That's okay. Um, who is it? I can't really see. I'm my name is John Harbold. Okay, John. All right. Um, all right. So that's good. We got one. We got one person. Okay. Are you familiar with Coomer computation for fractional explanation of how linear equations can fit into system Verilog? or any system in general that is linear, that can be parallel, and uh, just linear and parallel in general, um, with, with using zeros and ones. But in essence, that's not how quantum states are computed. You would need a linear equation with arrays. Does that sound about correct? Or, or um, um, does that sound about correct? Yeah, that does. All right, so I'm going to go here. So let me go back to, let's see. So this is the Coomer extension that I was mentioning. Oh, shoot, I can't make it bigger. Uh, let's see, one second. Slide. Where's it? Be over slideshow. Um, so the Coomer extension, um, if you look at the mathematics and stuff here, you need our roots, roots of entities, see x minus 1, or the little symbol there. So what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to create an array. The way that you create an array is by taking, uh, let's see, where did it go? Uh, where did it go? All right, taking um, taking the, uh, right here, let's see, standard representation, taking the standard representation of this quantum state. A quantum state can go back and forth and carry the data um, in parallel from, z say that you need to carry an array from zero to one trillion. Um, in a microprocessor, it can only do it one at a time. Am I correct? Correct. Okay, so how do you, how would you suggest, I'm just, just, how would you suggest a, a parallel circuit would work similar to the um, FPGAs? Do you think that is possible if you teach the computer to think 
the computer program to think mathematically. Um, the example that I'm going to give you is, uh, let me get to it, um, is this. So whenever you, whenever you're programming, um, instead of putting one minus one, you're putting just zero, zero plus zero, just to make it simple. Am I correct? Yep. Okay, so what if you write a linear equation? So this right here is kind of a linear equation as best I can. So the original, the arrangement of the blocks or the linear equation would be one minus one, which is zero. So you have a ground state where you can start. So now that you're at the ground state, you can move over to, to multiply or find the product of the next array or the amount of data that's involved. Um, are you following this? Yes. Okay, so we have one plus zero. So I'll give you an example right here. So um, this is, uh, so we'll see if I can find it. So essentially you see this equation. So we're gonna call this quibit one. Number two is quibit two, number three is quibit three. We haven't programmed it necessarily. We've had a lot of um, you know, syntax errors. We spent like an hour trying to figure it out. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna take the logic size of A and zero. So we know that we need to start out of the ground state, but what if we wanna have an infinite loop? Um, an infinite loop is basically starting at zero and one. Um, if you keep on going back to that and you use a summation with product, um, you're able to get that linear equation in infinite loop, essentially able to compute trillions of bytes of data or more. Um, does that make sense? Yep. All right, so, so when we look at this, um, Don, can you go over this a little bit, explain to him the logic ray and how the, uh, let's see, uh, let's see if it makes sense. Let's see if I've got that. Uh, what do you explain yeah, that? I actually okay. worked on it a little bit this morning and, and I think it's clear now. Okay. Um, were you um, able to run the program? No, it's, it's not runnable yet, but it, it kind of partitions it out on how we would do it in system bear log. You want me to share the screen and, and go over it really quickly? Yes, please do. Please do. Okay. Right, there we go. I have our time speaking in computer language. Mine's more mathematical. So, um, now don't give me a test on what Brett said later. <laughs> I'm more embedded systems, not heavy math, but based on what he told me, uh, this is what I came up with, with, um, bear log codes and, and how you might simulate, uh, a, a parallel type quantum computer. So basically, uh, logic, we, we define the uh, Q size to whatever size you want. It could be 31 bits, it could be 128, it could be 1,000 bits. Depends on the size of your FPJ. That's a limiting factor. So I just set it for 31, or actually it's 32. You have to add one to it. So we create a qubit 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. So qubit 1 through 4 is going to be our data and qubit five will be the result of the computation of the first four. You also need a corresponding flag because we don't know we don't know that the processing will all complete at the same time. So we need a corresponding uh, uh, processing done flag for each one of the qubits. Um, so I don't remember what A and B was, but um, we here we create an array that is the the uh, the cell is 32 bits wide. It's the same size as the we define the qubit, and then it's going to be um, it's an array of four down to zero. So that's going to be like 16 uh, 16 cells by 32 bits. We're also going to create I is the um, uh, the iteration uh, number. So you want to process the first qubit. So um, you have Brett's crazy code in here, which I don't, yeah, it's, um, this does synthesize, by the way, so it, it is correct. So you have an, a, a, a for next loop. And um, so it's going to calculate 
the the value of that qubit and then um yeah this qubit flag should be up here oh there it is i have it so then it, then after all this processing done it sets the qubit flag to being true so you do this for all four of the qubits and i didn't finish this one here but at so what happens is these four will process in parallel at the same time because they're using what system Verilog does is it creates cert, a separate circuit for each one of these always statements. And so all these circuits are running in parallel. And then at the very end, uh, whatever code that Brett wants, that's going to um, take the outputs of this qubit processing. It will, he'll put his code here, which I didn't put it in, in there. And then it would update qubit, qubit five. So I'm going to give you, go ahead and take the screen back. Uh, let's see. Where do I do? Share the screen. Uh, let me share the screen. All right. So um, are we, uh, hold on a second. Let me change that. So I share. So, um, um, so uh, um, who was familiar with the quantum computing again? I'm a little slow sometimes with names. Um, and um, what was, um, who was familiar with quantum computing? I can't remember the name. I'm not very good with remembering names. Because um, I had a question for you. Um, what you thought of the... Um, that was John. The, oh, that was John? Okay. That was John. Okay. Um, John, what do you think of this process that, we're, that, I'm, that we are developing um, for quantum simulation? Um, what are your thoughts on this? Has Google... Because I remember reading Google would use an array kind of Thing with a microprocessor, um, but the problem oh, that they were having is the processing speed itself. Um, and believe it or not, I have I tried doing this with Python using Atom, and what happened was my Dell laptop literally blacked out, wouldn't stop running, and started started smoking. I know this sounds kind of crazy, but I had to set it outside and let it do its thing. Essentially, the computer was inoperable after that. Dell sent me another one. And um, I kind of did the same thing again, and it just froze the whole computer and just didn't work. So that kind of gives you an idea of how much processing power. And the problem that Google, I believe, had with trying to use quantum computers on a standard microprocessor. Does that sound about right? Well, what you're doing is you're emulating a quantum effect. What I think right. is going on at Google is they're actually using um, uh, the, the actual quantum effect itself, okay? okay. And which means they're probably using uh, cryogenics in this. So basically they're operating at the ground state of uh, whatever they want to use. And then they uh, implement the problem in the quantum state. And then they say, okay, let it evolve and see what happens. I hope that makes sense. It does make sense. Now I want to see. I want to show you something if I can find the map back. Get back to the map. Okay. So my next my next step is besides linear equation. My next step is to um, basically create Lie manifolds that are for basically um, pi or block or block sphere representation. Now what I want to do with this is essentially use pi as a variable. So um, in order to compute pi, you put pi, but what if you're able to use the quibit that I suggested on the, oh, let's see where they go. Uh, so instead of using you, and let's see if I can find it. Let me go back to here one second. All right, so see how this is here. So what if we do one minus one at the ground state right here, and then say that we somehow put pi here, um, you would need an array to calculate um, the amount of spheres. So what you do, is you take, I guess, uh, you take the volume of the sphere or the volume of the atom, and you start at a ground state. And essentially what you're able to do is you're able to emulate the quantum state from this FPGA or in Verilog. And the whole goal behind this is to start creating programs of qubits and emulating a quantum computer to do extremely complex mathematical expressions. Um, and that's something that I'm trying to do with this. I've tried using MATLAB. 
um, ComSol for some of it for simulations and stuff like that. There's another one I can't remember. But I've tried using this and it's very, very complex. I'll give you an example of what I sent Don Golden. Uh, here's the New Year's Stokes. So I wrote this equation. Uh, this was several years ago. It could be wrong. Um, but there's more to it. As you can see, there's a lot to it. And this is essentially how to solve the Navier Stokes equation. So what I wanted to do was to essentially put all of this taking the dimensional space, which would be the which would be the pi or the qubit itself as an atomic um, representation. Um, then you would use time or flow, which would start at ground state, and you would use the infinite loop between zero, one, on and off. So, and then you need a velocity of water, H2, H2O, uh, velocity of water. So the way that you calculate the velocity of water is do it mathematically, like you would see here, I'll give you an example. So we will take the velocity, which I, I, just, I have to do this just because there's so much in my loss. Hold on a second. So what you have to do is you have to take the, where's the, I know what it is. It just takes me forever to remember stuff because I've done a lot of math over the years. Ah, oh, there it is, that's what I'm looking for. There it is. So we need the average velocity displacement and change of time. So in order to run this um, assistant, this um, emulation of the Navier Stokes, we need a change in time, which is zero and one, and we have a displacement. Now the displacement is kind of hard to do when you use MATLAB, as far as I'm, as far as I know. Now let me get back to it. Where did I go? So we need a displacement. So the length of the rotation relative to RPM. Now what we're trying to do is trying to figure out the turbulent flow between this this quantum state. It's down to a quantum level, down to the atomic level. And this is something that I wanted to do. Um, if you look at the quantum state in classical mechanics, um, every uh, um, a, a wave is also a particle and also a wave. So what if we're able to take that wave and create a volume, um, a volume of space? So that's kind of where what I'm doing with this um, for a novel process. We root that here. And this is kind of the general gist of it. So in this abstract, we'll define the following components of fluid dynamics. Um, we will use viscosity, meniscus pressure, basically a straw, um, and a, basically a straw, water going in and out of straw. Well, you need, you need a, um, let's see, a, a meniscus to hold the pressure of that water in place. So that pressure would be a variable, would be a quantum state. Now pressure, um, pressure, let's see, uh, let's see if I can remember this. I'm going through this stuff and I hope I'm not going on and on. Uh, this is kind of gives you an idea of pressure and quantum mechanics. Uh, let's see, it's pressure. Let's see if I can find it. And then see, you would do this. You would expect to see how you would have respect to volume between the amount of liquid and the amount of volume. So you would actually take this equation, 1.98.5 or whatever the number is, and you would enter that into, into this mathematical equation as quib at one or that mathematical representation. Now, in order to get that number, you have to do the long division, the long math into this. But the way around it is just by simply calling it quibit one. So quibit one will be the representation of the number. And we're able to find an answer to the amount of pressure for the, for the total volume. And when you have 10 to one, 10 to one, these would be the amount of static states because you need a state of an array. So in each array, you have a static state of the quantum Quantum, um, quantum representation that you're trying to develop. And that's essentially where I want to go with this emulation on the FPGAs to simplify it as best as I can. Um, does that make sense? Yes, it does. Mm. Do you think it's possible to do that on the FPGA the way that I've written this code? And has it, um, I'm self-taught, I've been reading encyclopedias and since I was six years old. I asked my dad too many questions. He says, I'm buying you an encyclopedia. He was in the military, worked with computers, and I learned how to use computers at a very young age. I'm 37. My first uh, computer I built was in 94. So it kind of gives you an idea of how old I am. I was nine years old when I built my first computer. It was actually, I think it was called a Compaq. I can't remember much about it, but I know I got frustrated with it and I had a difficult time with it. Google helps out with it nowadays. But back to what I was saying, um, do you, has anyone done this at all? Because I can't seem to find it. Maybe it didn't look well enough. But to me, it's a novel process. Would that be correct? Or is there somewhere that you can lead me in the it's direction? It's a novel process, but I keep coming back. You're emulating correct. a quantum process, which means mm -hmm. it's going to run a lot slower. Correct. Okay. Um, okay. 
when, when you get into quantum, uh, you know, real quantum, it's almost instantaneous. Mm -hmm. And the way around that is to, um, I don't know how long it, how long does it take approximately to um, process one bit? Do you know the time frame of that? Just a generalized no, I idea. No, I don't. We know it's very fast. This is what we know is it's yeah. very fast. So that's the only issue with this emulation is the speed. So what if we were able to um, improve the the fabrication of the FPGA? Um, so essentially, this is what we're going to do. We're going to slow down the electrons that are going. And I've got that right here. One second. Let me see if I can find that. Let's see. Nope, wrong one. All right. Let's see now. Come on. Let's see. Um, see the shared integers here that I was talking about? Um, signed yeah. integers. That's kind of how we would build the arrays. Um, that's kind of the gist of it. So let's see. And then you can see exponential functions and stuff the way that it is. Um, do you, all right. So I'm going to move on to the next one. Kind of give you an idea. All right. So let's see. Uh, okay. So it's used to efficiently compute the sum of three or more binary numbers. So that's what I'm trying to do with this. So in order to solve that down, you have to go to the fabrication level. Um, and you have to decode on the RSC machines and the CIS machines. Since there's no Minicode, um, once fetched, the instruction cache bits are shifted down the pipeline. So the thing with electrons, electrons in silicon, you may need another form of a, another form of material, but we're going to use silicon in this stage. So anytime there's information that is gathered between each quantum state, say that we want to have an electron enter this whole, because uh, when you're doing um, uh, mechanics and aerodynamics, uh, not aerodynamics, but physics in general, there's these little holes that all these electrons fit into and go through to create an electrical current. So what if we are able to use a, a novel process to, to find the exact size of that atom? So imagine having a block of uh, um, holes that are similar for a kid, how you got to put a square in. So what if we are able to measure that indefinitely or close to it using I don't know if it would be the covalent radius of the atom. So we find a material that can go back and forth between that hole while generating enough electrons, enough protons to create a negative quasi state to a degree. So in order to wait to do that is by doing something I call wave duality multiprocessing. Essentially, you take the volume of that electrical current, um, ohms and volts, and create a volume. Once you create that volume, you're able to have a pressure threshold. Once you identify that pressure pressure, you will need a variable electronic circuit that can generate as low as you can the amount of voltage, like picovolts, so that you can move the electrons back and forth at a specific at a specific um, speed, for lack of a better term, or velocity in this case because it has pressure. And then you're able to tell that FPGA or that silicon chip what to do at the quantum level. Now, what we need to do is we need to have super and um, what was it called? Super is it superposition or supposition where everything's yes. back down to zero? So that is the general gist of what I am trying to do. Um, and I'm working on it with the emulator so we can say, hey, if it could be done on an FBGA, although slower, why can't we use another silicon chip or something similar to that where it's not so difficult by using what the current processes of quantum computers without using super sub supposition super supposition i'm super kind of thinking grab actually sorry go ahead superposition is the word yeah it's one of those words yeah so superposition and that's going to be a big thing in the future so how do we how do we negate or lower the threshold for how much supposition we need that's the question that's what i'm trying to do with this emulator is to test it without building a supercomputer or changing the fabrication so we're able to run simulations and emulations, well, numerical emulations is what we're able to do. And something that I'm always quoting is math does not lie. And how accurate that is, but if you write the math correctly, and even if you don't write it correctly, it still shows you um, interesting things that you normally wouldn't see. So that's kind of where I'm at with that. And that's pretty much the spiel of my whole presentation. Yeah, I... Um... <clears throat> Before I talk to Brett, um, a link came up on my on my screen about uh, announcement of a new supercomputer. I went and looked at it. Um, at ten thousand blade 
basically blade servers is what how they're building supercomputers these days and um <clears throat> they were talking about uh simulating um quantum computing on this thing and then and then brett showed up <laughs> so i you know um that's way over my head guys <laughs> so um but but here's here's the point <laughs> We're all fourth people. We want the fourth is um, is out of favor with computer science types, right? We we all know that everything C and C plus plus and C derivatives. Um, one of the things I was thinking about, and if you remember my talk or my conversation with Greg Bailey back on Fourth Day. Uh, when he was talking about the green arrays and what he was doing and stuff. And I said to him, I said, you know, you, you have to find a killer app for your green array technology. Remember he was trying to get into education or something. And I believe that this core one project could be that killer app to get forth out there again. And Brett's interest in the core one I mean, I didn't know him from Adam, a week, you know, a week ago. Um, there are people out there that are using these C tools, trying to do things, and ain't happening. Um, one of my favorite podcasters is Lex Friedman. He, uh, <laughs> and it's a challenge. It's a three-hour podcast, typically. But I, I watch him regularly. I probably watched five to six of his podcasts a month and the, the um in the last two weeks he had two people on there one of them was an astrophysicist and the actress astrophysicist said you know uh when i was in school i took programming because i wanted to be a programmer and he said i just i just didn't get it you know you misplace a curly brace and, and your your code blows up right and so he he was so frustrated with programming, he went into astrophysics, and he's one of the leaders in astrophysics. You, you know, what's interesting is, uh, is you know, I, my degrees are in astronomy, and my uh, specialty is uh, astrophysics, because uh, one of the classes I took was uh, stellar interiors. And yeah, you know, yeah. So there, there's a lot of people out there that I would wrote the code in C, and from the time I started inputting the code to the time that my program uh, converged was like five hours. Okay. I can understand the guy because I was helping my uh, classmates with their programming and how they were doing stuff. You know, so yeah, if you don't, you know, if you can't grasp the programming aspects, you know, then you're lost. But when I was an undergraduate, I did, you know, this was in the days of the HP 35 when it was $700 of 1972 bucks. That was a lot of money. And I'm going, hey, you know, I can use the school's computer, which was nice because one of the graduate students who became a, a department chairman, uh, he said, oh, yeah, don't worry. You know, you write your program on punch cards and I'll put it at the uh, head of the queue and uh, let it run. And that's how I did it. That's how I was able to draft when I was fighting in uh, Fortran. You know, and then I went on to uh, assembly and then C, C++, and the whole menagerie of languages. But yeah, it, once you get a grasp of it, you know, it, 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 it makes life a whole lot easier. And what's also interesting is, you know, in using the quantum mechanics, to solve uh, uh, problems like how do uh, supernovae uh, explosions happen? Okay, how do they do that? Because that takes a lot of uh, computation to do that. And that's like you said, some of these supercomputers have like 10,000, 100,000 uh, blades in them. And here's the thing. Um, oh God, who's that company? That's AMD. Um, they have a blade that they developed where it has 200 
milliliters. 512 cores, and each core can have two threads on it. So you're talking about a uh, blade that has 1,024, basically 1,024 cores running in parallel. Okay. And also they use InfiniBand to connect all these uh, uh, blades together. So that makes the computation, you know, transferring, you know, data between blades makes it a lot quicker. But to be able to do this using quantum mechanics, oh my God, the stuff you can do is just being able to uh, implement your equations and your uh, uh, initial conditions, you know, and boundary conditions, and just say, okay, let it evolve. And I mean, that just would be, oh Lord. I would love to be able to do that. Okay, so, so go ahead. Um, yeah, and then and then there was a, a second, a second person, you know, big gun that was interviewed, and and he kind of said the same, a similar sort of thing. So, if you you know, uh, I'll I'll get into the core one in, in just a few minutes. Um, because you're able to um you know to use forth as the the high level uh interface to the parallel machines inside of the FPGA and you could write you know test benches um in forth high level code instead of writing them in system verilog and then running them in a simulator you could literally you know you know test them and you can interrogate registers inside the FPJ and that sort of thing. You can put 32-bit core ones that are just internal SRAM and internal boot ROM. It's a it's a stripped down core one. It's probably only uh, like 15, 13 or fifteen hundred LUTs. An eighty-five an eighty-five thousand LUT FPJ costs forty-five dollars. So you could put 50, 50, 32 bit core ones inside a $50 chip. So if you think about making a PC board that plugs into a high speed backplane, you could easily get to thousands of cores running in parallel. Um, you don't always necessarily want to put a core one on a problem because it costs you 1300 less. If you're if if you're processing your code, if you write in a system bear log and it only comes out to be 400 LUTs, obviously you should be instead of using a uh, a core a core one core, you obviously should be using system bear log because system bear log is the assembler in core one, and it also runs way faster than fourth itself. Fourth will run it one, um, you know. Most instructions, simple instructions, will run at one clock cycle that can be up to 200 megahertz. So, so my thinking is, the core one project could be used to go and to to people that are trying to solve problems, scientists, mathematicians, and and then um, you know. Instead of trying to market it to the computer science people, which, you know, I would market to everybody, but I would kind of specifically try to find some some people out there that are trying to do something and they're having a hard time on regular computer hardware and computer um, programs. And if we can get a half a dozen of these people saying that, you know, the core one concept you just really open the doors for their project. Then you would start, I mean, people, people would start writing papers about it, you know, scientists and stuff. And so that would be a killer app to get forth going again. And that's one of the things, uh, my interest in this project. So I'm going to share my screen and give you a, it's only about 13 slide presentation here. Let's see. Oh, yes. <laughs> 